So we are talking again about the kingdom. But this, what we call the Sermon on the Mount again, is the manifesto, manifesto of the kingdom. And it is again a portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is a portrait of what he expects in our lives. Some people say it's out of reach. For instance, the statement, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, that this is not realistic. Well, do you think that uh, God would impose on us something which is impossible? You know, if you cover this floor with glass and then you put some oil on it and then you smear it with um, petroleum jelly and you put somebody in the middle and you sit at the side and say, now you get up and walk here, they couldn't do it in a thousand years. There's no traction. The oil and the... Uh, petroleum jelly and the glass on the knees would mean that they just could not, every time they tried to get up they'd slip, there's no possible way that they could move. Well does God impose things like that on us? I'm quite sure that he doesn't. Again this, as the Lord Jesus says, the kingdom of God is within you. They were still looking for a kingdom. And I remind you again that even after he taught them for three years and they'd seen everything and heard everything it was possible for them to hear from him, and yet just before he departed and, and he said he would come again and they said immediately will you set up your kingdom they still wanted a kingdom because every other kingdom obviously is a visible kingdom this kingdom is an invisible kingdom every other kingdom has a visible king wearing a crown having his entourage and he has his uh, usually his castle and he, 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 he displays wealth and power he has armies, he has other things to impress and show you that he's the head of the pile, he is the king. And Jesus has nothing of the kind. He has no crown, they uh, gave him a crown and so on. But he has no other crown, he has no dignitaries following him. Everybody he has with him is uh, without any social standing really. Fishermen and tax gatherers who are despised and still are. And uh, <laughs> lots of people of that caliber, but he had no distinguished people. And again, it, it's so different when you visualize the, the setting up of the first kingdom, if you like, in the Ten Commandments. Do you remember that Moses was allowed to go up the mountain? And uh, you can visualize the mountain, I kind of visualize it this way, that here, here is a mountain peak, uh, put it up like this, but the mountain is shrouded in, in cloud and vivid lightning. And here you have Jesus on an ordinary kind of a small little hill, a mount sure enough. But here, this is ringed off, this is F, we'll say, <coughs> excuse me, F for forbidden ground. Uh, Hebrews says even if a beast went in there, it died. This is sanctified ground, this is holy ground. This is God's majestic presence and power and authority and dominion. And if you come in here, you're going to be in trouble. You know, you get a, a classical example of that in the case of King Uzziah. You know, King Uzziah was, uh, what, he went to the throne when he was, what, um, 16 years of age, and he reigned about 50 years, and he was a, a very successful king. You can read that, I think, in about Second uh, Chronicles 26, somewhere there. And everything he did prospered. He extended the, the nation territorially. Uh, he had no problem with the farmers like the president has. <coughs> the, the farmers were all in subjection, they increased their vineyards. Uh, he invented war machines. These great big catapults they put rocks in and hurled them. It says he invented many things. He built bridges. And everything he did prospered. He was very much like the man in Psalm 1. But then he became arrogant. You know, one of my simple definitions is this, that if you have power, you need power not to use that power. Otherwise, you strut around and show everybody, I've got power, now look who I am, and I just want to tell you I can go into any area. So King Uzziah thought he could do it. The sanctuary was like this place, there was an awesomeness about it, let's make it like this, for, if you like, for the building, and, and here is an altar, and that is forbidden ground as much as this was forbidden ground. But he says, well, what do I care? I, I am the king. I'm King Uzziah. And therefore, I have, he believed in the divine right of kings. I can do what I like, when I like. And we're told that about 80 priests tried to push him out of the way and say, don't do that because if you do, you're going to be in trouble. But he still persisted, and the moment he crossed into that forbidden territory, you remember that he was uh, stricken with leprosy. 
I think that's an awesome thing. I, I, I don't think we... Let me put it this way. I think so often <coughs> we're hard on other people and easy on ourselves. Now that's a sign of spiritual weakness. You ought to be hard on yourself and easy on others. That's a sign of grace. You know, I hadn't thought of this till last year. How merciful God is. He took a man like Moses who was stained with blood. He was a murderer. And he, he wasn't as smart as he thought he was <laughs> because <coughs> he killed somebody and pushed him under the sand and then, you know, rubbed his foot over the sand and said, nobody will find out. Well, he forgot that God marked the spot anyhow. And yet, despite the fact he was a murderer, God used him, made him. The Jews still think the greatest man that ever lived. He was a marvelous man. Uh, where? Seven. Read the seventh chapter of Acts, not now, but later. <laughs> and uh, you, you get a wonderful description of Moses because it says he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in word. Now, that doesn't mean he was an orator. We think a man is mighty in word when he's a great orator, you know, and he displays all his stuff, whether he's an evangelist or a politician. He has to show you his, his might of words, the strength of his vocabulary and everything else. But it says that Moses was, Moses was mighty in word, but, but, but he couldn't talk. How do you know? Because it says he stammered. He didn't want the job. I guess some of you are really fry, uh, uh, longing for leadership. Well, if you are, you're very stupid. That's the last thing you should want. I have never sought leadership in my life. It, it's too awesome. I don't care whether you're going to take a bunch of uh, folk from here or a leader church or any the, the awesomeness of being a leader is just just frightening really because so often people pattern themselves after their leader and if he's not a spiritual man well god help the group that follow him he may be a preacher that doesn't mean he's spiritual <coughs> he may be the leader of a group that doesn't mean he's spiritual he may have got there by sure being brushed and getting to the head and pushing other people down but Moses again was a murderer <coughs> And yet not once in his life did God ever cast that in his face. Not as the scripture says, cast things in your teeth. God never said, look, you better watch your step because I know you're a murderer. He never said that. But one day he disobeyed God for about 30 seconds. He got furious, he got angry. And for that 30 seconds of bad temper, he got 40 years punishment. Now we think that God doesn't do things like that. Oh yes, he does. You see, the higher you testify you are, the more God has the right to test you and the more the devil will assail you. If you've got a lofty idea of yourself, big, you know, influential, outstanding, gifted, talented, one of those geniuses that somehow people have not yet recognized. Isn't it awful when you're full of genius and nobody recognizes it? You wonder when the you wonder the church is in a message thing. It doesn't realize what well, I'm a kind of a secret hidden apostle Paul. Well, I'm not as good as that. I'm just another cynic. <coughs> but, uh, you know, that, that, that secret thing in me, yet yeah, there's so much undiscovered wealth in me and so forth. So what? Uh, you know, the most difficult thing in our lives is the drying out period. <laughs> the apostle goes down the Damascus Road and infinitely mercy of God, infinite mercy of God, God revealed himself to him. And then God says, I've got a school. There's not many students in my school. But I'd like to take you there. And so the man of God says, well, Lord, you do just that. Because I've been the worst assailant of Christianity. I'd like to be the best example of it. The Lord says, all right. I reveal myself to you on the Damascus Road. Now, <coughs> come behind the bushes here. Get lost. For about three and a half years. And I reveal myself in you. Now, there are a lot of people that God has revealed himself to, but not many people he reveals himself in. You see. And this is something that we need to realize. After all, uh, you, you can blame so many people for your uh, static spiritual life, if you like, or uh, uh, what, what I mean, not, not just static that you're far off, but I mean you become static, stationary. You can blame the in-laws or the outlaws or the devil or somebody else. But really, if you're in God's will, it is God that worketh in you. He's got the program. He's got the timetable. So Moses is 40 years on the backside of the desert. He's loaded with intellectual power. 
If it stayed as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he might have been Ramesses the third or somebody. We might have images fifty feet high in the in the Nile Valley and somebody saying, Well that that's Moses, that's Moses and, and you know, standing with reverence in front of it. But what did he do? <clears throat> he chose. Now there's your problem all through life. What is life? It's a series of choices. You get over one and say to yourself, Well, I know this, that's the biggest choice I'll ever make. And five years after you think, well, boy, all I did was I decided to get out of my playpen. Hmm? I, I, I left the things which are behind. Now the Lord says, listen, you, you, you climbed out of this little playpen that you're in here. It's a playpen kind of thing. You were in this playpen, the Lord says, climb out, look, there are mountains here. What about getting up there? Because that's all life is. It's a series of, of choices. And Moses deliberately made a choice <coughs> not to be a king not to be the darling of a, of a, 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 a princess that thought he was the most amazing king you know it, there is a lot, there's a lot of humor in the Bible if you read it carefully I'm a, I've got a streak of humor I think uh, like the Irish fellows have but, but anyhow I've got a streak of humor and you know, it, it's wonderful that the reason that Moses was hidden in the bushes his, his name Moses means drawn out that was the name they gave to him later. But it's amazing when you think that actually he had a sentence of death on him. You know, if you study carefully, you'll find the life of Moses, the life of Jesus, parallel very easily. Where was Moses born? He was born in the slave system. Where was Jesus born? He was born in the slave system. Again, the church of Jesus Christ was not born in a free society. The church of Jesus Christ wasn't served up to the world on a silver platter. The Church of Jesus Christ was born in a sophisticated totalitarian society. The Romans were over in Ireland, or they were over in England 55 years before Jesus was born. They spread their awful tentacles and like an octopus they were gripping the world. The world was in a state of slavery. We think the world's in a mess now. Well, all it's done is make a complete circle. In England they sing Britons never shall be slaves and <coughs> here we say we're in the land of the free. Never seen anybody free yet. As soon as they get free, they decide to become enslaved to dope and drink and tobacco and lust. And who's free? Most Christians are not free. As I said the other day, they're like Lazarus. Here's Lazarus inside of the... Here's, in the, here's the stone and they roll the stone away and Lazarus comes out looking a bit like... How do he look? A bit like this. Now, he's come out of there. That's death. Jesus says, come out. He comes out. He walks out. But he's bound hand and foot with grave clothes. Can't see where he's going, can't do anything, his hands can't serve, his feet can't walk, he, he shuffles like this, but he can't see or smell or do it. He's no good. You can't question that he's alive, he is alive. Otherwise he'd still be in the morgue or the tomb. Jesus speaks the word and he comes to life, but he's bound hand and foot. Pardon me, he's bound hand and foot with grave clothes. Isn't it true to say, you know, people say, well, you mustn't judge. That's the most stupid thing in the world. You judge all the day you live. Don't you? For instance, Jesus says, cast not your pearls before swine. Well, you've got to judge at the swine before you cast your pearls, haven't you? You don't judge. Oh, but you do judge because it says there in the uh, seventh chapter of John that we're to judge righteous judgment. Now, if you don't judge, you'll live under somebody else's judgment anyhow. But God has given you the capacity, not only intellectually, but spiritually, to discern between good and evil, right and wrong, and so forth and so on. Moses is taken to the backside of the desert. Moses chose <coughs> to suffer, suffer affliction with the children of God. Rather than to enjoy... Why did he do it? Because there's a little thing that occurs about twice, I guess, in the epistle to the Hebrews, 11th chapter. What did he do? I don't know how he came to the conclusion, I don't understand it, but I'll tell you what it says. <coughs> he chose rather to suffer affliction with the children of God, hmm? considering what? The reproach of Christ greater than all the treasures in Egypt? How did he know about Christ? Well, that's what the book says, and I take it. So again, life is this, you see, are you going to jump into that which immediately looks the most profitable even in Christian work? There's a story about a little fellow, uh, his playmate said to him, well, your daddy hasn't been our pastor very long, has he? He said, no, he hasn't, about uh, four years. But, um, 
I hear he got a call to another church. Yes, a big church. Big church with a big house. They've got to give him a big car and a big salary. So the little fellow said, is your daddy going to take it? He said, well, daddy's praying, but mother's packing. <clears throat> Why not? It's a bigger church with a bigger income. You know, one of the greatest men that ever lived in England never had a large church. He was a man by the name of John Fletcher. Charles, John Wesley said he was the greatest saint that had lived since the Apostle Paul. He lived in a place called Maidley, Shropshire. And they said when he went past the, ta past the tavern, men would take off their hats. And they were half drunk, they'd be there by the wall and they'd say, there goes the man that loves our souls. John Wesley said he was the most holy man. <clears throat> he believed that had lived since the days of the Apostle. He's a very profound teacher. He, he, he wrote a thick volume of, of uh, Czech Strantinomianism. You should get it. Make your headache a bit, but then it's, uh, it's worth reading. We need mental challenges. We need spiritual challenges. But <coughs> this godly, saintly man, and it shows you again, you see, that it doesn't matter how smart you are, and you may be very smart, you may be very holy, you still make mistakes and misjudge. God will share a lot of things with you. He'll share his love. His love is shed abroad in the heart by the Holy Ghost. Um, he'll give you power, the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon you. He'll give you wisdom. He's made unto us wisdom and righteousness. But there's one thing he'll never share with you, that is his glory. And another thing is, he'll never share his infallibility. We still make mistakes. They're good for us sometimes to make mistakes. And John Wesley said of this godly, saintly man, the most saintly man he'd ever met, he said, you know now, <clears throat> I can die comfortably and I'll hand the reins of Methodism over into the hands of John Fletcher. But one day John Wesley stood at the grave of John Fletcher. And Wesley lived about 30 years after he'd buried John Fletcher. When somebody said to Wesley, Mr. Wesley, you're grieving that your wonderful friend has died. <clears throat> he said, yes. This person said, well, don't grieve. Why not? Well, you're going to be with him in eternity forever, aren't you? And he, he, he put it like this. He said, well, I'll tell you. This is what I think. If you describe this as eternity, this, this, this way as eternity, and here is the throne of God, he said, John Fletcher has graduated, in my opinion, to be round there with the apostles. But he said, J.W., John Wesley, will be so far away, I'll only see the reflected glory of Christ in the face of John Fletcher. Now that's quite a statement, isn't it, by a man that we think was one of the greatest men, at least I think Wesley was one of the greatest men ever. But you see, again, <clears throat> he esteemed this holy man, and, and though he wanted to hand over the reins, of the great flourishing Methodist church, God said no. Going back then here to this wonderful man, Moses made his choice, but God hid him away for 40 years. I don't know the answer, let me tell you again. I don't know why, one day I will. <coughs> me. In the Old Testament economy, a man could be a soldier when he was 20. Because he didn't need brains then or now to kill anybody, so you could be a soldier when you were 20. I take the view of the precious Quaker friends, I don't think Christians should fight. We're supposed to live as Jesus would live, that's what the scripture says, it doesn't matter what your theology is, the scripture says that we should do what Jesus did. He was in this world and we should follow in his steps, Peter says, and then he tells you what the steps are, lest we imagine them, he says he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Can you imagine Jesus with a machine gun? cutting people down? Can you imagine him dropping a bomb on Hiroshima at what, 16 minutes to 8 on the 6th of August 1945? Can you imagine Jesus liquidating a city and sending, uh, I don't know, thousands of people to destruction? A man came to our church when I was pastoring in Bath and he was a, a high Air Force officer. He came to me one day and said, Brother Angel, I'm going to have to quit in the Air Force and I'll have to go to jail. He said, I can't lie on my belly, I can't guide a plane and press a button and drop a, a bomb on, uh, well, I say, Dresden or Hamburg in, in, uh, in Germany. 
And when that bomb goes down, say, maybe I killed, uh, I destroyed maybe 30 prayer meetings tonight. I, I, I cut them off. I can't do it. And he went to jail. I visited him in jail for a long while after that. The church has been so far back from this Sermon on the Mount. You see, again, if God is going to get the best out of us, there has to be a hiding place for all of us. Again, a man could not, could be a soldier when he was 20, he could not be a high, he could not be a priest until he was 25, he could not be a high priest until he was 30. Now you find the answer to this, nobody's ever given it to me. Jesus did not minister till he was 30, John Baptist did not minister till he was 30, the Apostle Paul was more than 30. So was Moses, Moses was in school for 40 years. We think we're washed up. I'm not 80 yet. I'm getting up there, but uh, I don't think I'd like to start my work for the Lord at 80. But that's when he started. You see, there's, there's no timetable. You can go to a Bible school and they put you on the assembly line. You come off. You've got the same notes that 10,000 other students have in the country. You've got the same diploma and about as much vision, as much passion, maybe, because they become mechanical. That is a hiding place. I used to talk, talk very often, just Dr. Tozer and I, and he'd tell me about the days when he was a youngster and how he lived on a, a little farm up in the hills of Pennsylvania. He never went to Bible school, never went to seminary. He wrote some of the finest modern literature that we have on the spiritual life. But he did all his digging there in the Word of God. He read the mystics, he read the Madame Guillaume and the Ladder of Sanctity and the Cloud of Unknowing and all those other wonderful, wonderful books that are hard to read, but he read them taught himself a little Latin, taught himself a little Greek. Without any aid, but he did all that spade work, the thing is, he came up not as a copy of a copy of a copy. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a saying amongst artists, you never copy copies. Somebody once painted a picture, and then they let somebody else copy it, and they pass it on, and they copy it from the copy, who copy it from, And when he got to the end, the, the picture at the end, when 20 people had done, was nowhere like the picture at the beginning. Because they hadn't copied the original, they had copied copies. Now, I don't know whether you've got so far in your spiritual life that like the Apostle Paul, he says, you be followers of me, even as I am of Christ. I followed so closely, I've obeyed him so implicitly that if you follow, well, I'm willing to take the responsibility, as it were. When I get to the judgment, I set the standard. Here you are, you follow me, and you'll be okay. Everything will be great for you in that great day. Now, how many preachers dare say that? Or evangelists, or teachers, or missionaries? How many dare? We say, now, don't look to me. Why not? Why not? As I say, I, I, I like to do a little sketching now and again, don't get time to do it, but I, I used to like to draw eagles, and I've been sketching about a year ago, uh, you know, drooling, thinking of things, and I sketched an eagle. Somebody came in my office and said, well, uh, oh, I like this bird. I said, yeah, uh, it's a nice sketch. I said, oh. Do you know who did it? I said, yes. Yeah, I know who did it. Oh. Who, well, could I get one? I said, sure, take that one. <clears throat> Don't you want it? I said, no, I did it. Oh, well, sign it for me. I mean, I want to put it up in my office. Sign it. I said, not on your life. Not if you give me ten dollars, I won't sign it. Why not? Because I'm rather disgusted. It's not quite proportionate. I've done it uh, spasmodically. It's not really symmetrical that I can see faults in it. Well, I don't care. Oh, but I care. Because, you see, you stick it on the wall of your office and I say, Ravenel did that? Well, look, I want to tell you this. That. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Now, you do a little homework and at the end of every day, ask yourself if God can autograph your life. Because it says we are his workmanship. What has he been working in us? What has he been working out of us? You say, well, I'm busy doing this. No, 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 no. Come on, come on. Get your priorities right. Number one, you're to represent Jesus Christ every breathing moment that you have. Not when you feel like it. Not when you get the chance to show off, a, you know, on a, in a conference or sing your life out before a crowd or preach. A, no, 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 no. Come on. Do, do you know when we're most true to ourselves? In my judgment, this is almost philosophy. I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it anyhow. Do you know when we're most true to ourselves? In our unconscious moments. When we're not putting a show on, when somebody catches us like that. Sometimes we've gone to a home, the ladies come to the door and say, Oh, I didn't know I wouldn't have had these curlers and this and that. Oh, that's all right. 
You go to a house and somebody says, oh, 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 I'm sorry, but now listen, everything isn't tidy. What she should have said is, nothing ever is tidy in this house. Like the pastor going to the house, somebody said, go to see so-and-so, they've been to church twice or three times, you haven't been to see them. So I went and the lady, oh, I didn't know, oh, she said the house is like a pigsty. Come in, make yourself at home. <clears throat> Now, she didn't mean it all in the same way, but there it was. It, it, it was usual. It was a pigsty. It was never straight. You see, our unconscious moments were greater because we put a facade up. We want to... Do you ever feel you want to appear spiritual? Do you ever get the desire to impress? It's a great weakness amongst Christians. You know, I, you know, I want you to really know I'm spiritual, and we put on airs. I think that hurts God. It's a facade. <clears throat> but I'll say this and finish on this section here, that, 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 that if God's going to do a great thing in you, he's going to shunt you off somewhere for quietness. I'll be quite sure of that. I get calls and calls and calls from theological students who say, Mr. Abel, I'm leaving school, I've got, I'm going to graduate, but I'm not ready to go into ministry. What shall I do? <clears throat> and I've got a standard answer to all of them, for all of them. I say, stick your head in a haystack for six months. A man called me last year and he said, Brother Ravenel, I heard you preach on Elijah. And he said, just as you said, the secret of Paul, uh, Elijah's life is this. In one chapter God says, go hide thyself. And in the next chapter, go show thyself. As soon as you said, go hide yourself, the Lord said, that's what you... You know, God has used that in so many... It's not my word, it's God's word. Go hide thyself. And so many young men have said, that's what I've got to do. He said, it was May last year. He said, May, June, July, August, September. I'm booked every night to speak because I need the money to get the rest of the time in school. But I went home, he said, and I said to my new wife, she hadn't had an, an, uh, another wife, but she was a, just a recent acquisition. He'd just got married and he said... Uh, uh, I, 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 uh, well, darling, I want to tell you something. I feel that God is telling me to do what Ravenel said, go hide my head in a haystack. And uh, I'd like to cancel every meeting right till September. And she said, well, I, I, well, do it if this is what God says. So he phoned a farmer and said, I'd like to work for you during the summer till five at night and then quit. And all I ask of you is you'll give me a bed and food for myself, my wife, I'll sleep in a hayloft if need be. And he said, he accepted me. And he said, a buddy of mine, <coughs> a buddy of mine called me. And he said, you know, I've been thinking of what Ravenel said from Elijah there, go hide thyself. And he said, I think I should hide myself. So he said, well, I'm going to a certain farm and there's, there's other farms around. Let me ring and ask the farmer. So he phoned and asked the farmer. And the farmer said, well, my neighbor is wanting a man for the summer. <coughs> he needs some help. And this other man got the job. <coughs> this young man got the job too. Excuse me. And they stayed the whole summer in quietness, waiting on God. I said, what I literally said to him was, go hide your head in a haystack and <coughs> when you've done your work in the day, come home and sit with a farmer, have your supper, then put your head under a pump and get some cold water on it and get out and be quiet. I hit this thing years ago for myself. I've only seen eagles twice, I think once in Scotland and once over in the uh, over in the Rockies. Sometimes where we are down in uh, in Seguin there, some birds come over and sometimes they say they're eagles, they're Mexican eagles. They come over to spy on the workers or something, but anyhow they, they come over there. But you know, I've never seen eagles in bunches, they fly alone. Only twice I've seen whales. I saw one in mid-Atlantic. Actually, the Queen Mary who ran hit her way right in the middle. Just, just got it dead in the middle. Cut the thing into. We were on a French yacht down in the Bahamas about three years ago and we were, patro we were trolling a certain area, fishing, trying to get some fish to eat, those wonderful groupers. And the pilot, the skipper, it's, he has a crew on his boat and, and he turned the boat around. As he turned around, I looked over and I said, what an immense log. Somebody said, log? And I looked at the end, there was a fin. Oh, it's a whale. It was basking in the warm water. It was maybe about seven or eight inches under the water. It looked like a huge log. Lions don't rove in packs when they're hungry. They go alone. The king of the forest goes alone. 
the king of the air flies alone. The king of the sea, if you like, flies alone. Great men walk alone. You don't get half a dozen John the Baptist, do you? <clears throat> How many Elijahs do you have? Hmm? How many Apostle Paul? He goes and hides himself. God's university is a school of silence and it's a school of loneliness. And loneliness is one of the most difficult things to bear. <clears throat> but that's where God makes men. Dr. Wilbur Smith said the greatest expository he ever heard was Dr. G. Campbell Morgan. Well, I, I listen to Campbell Morgan very often. I remember him saying one day, you know, this book is so profound, I know so little about it. He'd written 50 books on it at that time. But he never went to Bible school or seminary. <clears throat> he got up in the hills of Wales, got his Bible, explored it. I don't know if you can find this book now. I've got one or two copies, but I, don't, I won't sell them. A, a book on, a, about, about, on the life of a man called John Sung, S-U-N-G. If you can find it, buy it. Don't sell it. It's about the young man that came to this country, maybe the most brilliant foreign student that ever came. He could hardly speak a word of English when he came. He mastered English. Didn't know a word of German. He mastered that in six months and took a study in it and examined it. He was in this country three and a half years and in that time he got his BA degree, his master's degree and earned a PhD and learned two or three languages. That's pretty good homework. He met God when he got his PhD. At the time that th three or four different nations were asking him to become the head of their nuclear fission or what we would say atomic research department. One night Somebody said to him, you look more like a preacher than you do a scientist. Now, I don't know how you have to look like to be like a preacher. I've never worked that one out. But you look more like a preacher than a scientist. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you go to Bible school? So he went to Union Theological Seminary in New York. And he said everything he believed about the Bible, he didn't believe when he'd been there about three or four months. They brainwashed him and he was fed up. One night he just fell at the side of his bed and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And like that... The burden fell, the light came, he came from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, and he opened the door of his bedroom and ran through the corridor like the man in Acts 3, leaping and praising God. So, being in a theological seminary, they were kind to him. You know what they did? You'd never believe it. You'd think they did it maybe in a brewery or something. They had him certified insane. They took him to an institution in White Plains, a medic... Uh, uh, um, place where folk go off the rocker, as we would say, and they shut him up. He escaped. <clears throat> they took him back. God said, you stay here for, I think it was 153 days, I'll reveal myself to you. God revealed himself to him. He stayed there for that number of days, and in that time he learned how to analyze a chapter of the Bible in eight different ways. I used his, uh, this as an illustration in a meeting. There's a big old lady there and the tears rolling down her face and she came up she said, Brother Ravenel, that was... Oh my, that was a tremendous thing you said about John Soong. I said, yeah, I noticed you were weeping. Have you read the book? She said, no, but I used to play uh, the organ for him in China in his meeting. And I'm told now that where the church is strongest in China with all its persecution, maybe you were too busy to pray for it this morning, but... Where the church is the uh, strongest in China today, strongest where two great men taught. One is Watchman Nee and the other is John Sung and the other is uh, amongst the very old people where Jonathan Goforth was. But God allowed him to go into a mental institution for all that time and in it God revealed himself and he revealed his word. See, we, we want it all serving up, don't we? We want to come to a school or go to a seminary and everybody serve it up and I'll go out and, uh, you know, you make all the bullets now I'll fire them. You don't, don't put too much work on me, too much sweat, too much... Well, you can go that way if you want, but it's a very poor way to go. If God is going to take you a long way up, he'll sure take you a long way down. If he's going to fill you, he'll empty you. If he's going to clothe you, he'll strip you. There's very little that's gratuitous Grace is free, that's true. We're not going to be re rewarded for grace in eternity. We're going, to be the, we're going to be rewarded for works. God works it in, you work it out. Work out your own salvation. As I tried to say the other night, we're going to be staggered when we get to the judgment seat. 
and see what little rewards many of us are going to have. The first should be last, the last should be first. Some of the greatest people I know in this world at this present moment never come to the surface. They never have any public ministry. Two little ladies that live not too far from here that spent five to six hours a day in prayer. My friend that didn't go to bed any night for 30 years that died not too long ago. Prayed every night for 30 years from 10 o'clock till 5 or 6 in the morning. That wasn't in Finney's day. You see, if this is really, if, the, if these things mentioned here are the clothing of a child of God, and let's, let's, let's think of it right here for a moment. <clears throat> you know, here are these eight, shall we call them eight attributes? What am I doing? Making an eight. Okay. These, these eight things that are mentioned here in the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> the Lord doesn't say, look, you, you only get one of these. Look, I'm going to give you meekness. You're, you're going to be blessed because you're meek. You're going to be blessed because you're pure in heart. You're going to be blessed because you're merciful. You're going to be blessed because... Uh, what? Uh, you're poor in spirit. You're going to be blessed be No, 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 no. It's just like the gifts of the Spirit. It says he gave to one what? The gift of tongue. He gave to another what? But it never says that about the fruits of the Spirit. I've only ever met in my life one person who claimed <coughs> he had all the gifts of the Spirit. And he impressed me for a day or two until he told me his wife was coming to the conference. And he said, you know, she's remarkable. She has every gift of the Spirit too. I said, oh, I, I, I can't wait to see her. And he said, you know, just last night she called me and said, you watch at noon tomorrow between 11 and 12 o'clock. She was 350 miles away. Between uh, 11 and 12 o'clock, two women will walk into your conference, one in blue. Now watch them, particularly the one in blue. She said this the day before. About half past 11 in the morning, two women came through the door. One in blue. I stayed clear of them. I didn't know which world they come from, whether they come from earth or hell or where they come from. So I stayed off. And this man was impressive and the woman. And then the last morning, my darling wife and I were there eating with them at breakfast. And he said, we do have a remarkable fellowship. We have a big house. They were, they were in the atomic research section of NASA. NASA, N-A-S-A, -A, you know, NASA. Not NASA, NASA. And he was very brilliant. And he said, we, we've worked up a fellowship. We've 70 to 80 people coming in our home. I said, well, it must be wonderful. You have all those people and you both have all the gifts of the Spirit. And he said, yeah, but, well, yeah. We've got three lovely sons, too. I said, oh. He said, that's one of the problems. I said, what, what do you mean it's one of the problems? Well, he said, right now my wife and I have decided to separate. We can't uh, live together. I wasn't interested. It doesn't work out. What good is it? You can have gifts, you can display them almost like a woman displays jewelry. What good are they if the, if the spirit isn't there? You see, here's a danger. You, you could have some gifts of the spirit, tongues or something else, and be backslidden and still use your gifts because the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You've got people going to the big... I, I, I can't get on some conference platform. Not that I want to. I, I don't accept every invitation I get by a long shot. And I certainly don't go to the biggest place or I won't be here. Or where I get most money or I won't be here. But... <laughs> I'm very careful where I go, as the Lord tells me. But I can't get on some platforms. Why? Because my stress is holiness and revival. But I'll tell you men going around this country that can get as much in a week as I would get in a month. And they go to the conference and explain gifts. And they're living with another man's wife. No, <coughs> they've left their wife and taken another woman. Charisma without character equals nothing. It's zero. And what is this Sermon on the Mount? Again, isn't it wonderful that this is an invisible kingdom? This is all inside of us. It's not external at all. It's internal beauty. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. God didn't look on the outside. He'd be uh, a little sad if he looked at some of us maybe. But oh, when he looks inside... I remember going to see a lady, she came to one of our meetings in, in, in Bradford, England, and uh, I, I, honest, I've seen some ugly women. But she was the ugliest, ugliest woman I have ever seen. 
she could have been a witch without any makeup. She'd have nose like a banana, her face was shrunken and, and big pleats and her eyes were too big. And she said, would you come and have some tea with us? You know, in England we drink a lot of tea and so we went to a little house. <clears throat> she had one room and in it she had a little bed. She had the bathroom, all the commode and everything, and at the side she had a little gas stove where she had to cook. She had to cook in there. She was extremely poor, but she was extremely powerful in prayer. And before we left, she said, now, she had a deep voice, it matched her ugly face almost, and, but you know, she said, oh, let's pray. Well, I didn't pray. My other two buddies, they didn't pray. But you know, I'd never forgotten the prayer of that woman. One of the most marvelous things I ever heard in my life. You know, when we knelt down, she looked like, a, I say, an old witch. When we got up, she looked like a cherubim as far as I was concerned. Just radiant with God. Just touched God in areas. I just felt she got hold of one horn of the altar, as it were, and had the other on earth, and she was communicating life and power and blessing through that fair. You see, again, as a good book says, there are vessels to honor and some to dishonor. When we're in the Bahamas, we stay with friends who are pretty well off and they're servants and everything's served up so exquisitely. Big mahogany table and all the silver is there and uh, uh, you get all the attention you want or don't want and it's real style. It's almost like Buckingham Palace, so I've never eaten there. And one day after we had a very wonderful meal, I walked through in the kitchen and there's a the big colored lady and she was cooking, very joyful kind. And I gave her a pat on the back. I said, you gave us a marvelous meal today. Not that they're not always marvellous, but somehow you excel. I think we had about five vegetables that day, and I don't know what in the world we didn't have with <coughs> excuse me, papaya and all those wonderful fruits they have down there. And as I turned to go out of the back door, a door onto the veranda, I noticed the kitchen sink. And it was piled up with greasy dishes and pans, and I don't know what in the world wasn't there. You know, I suddenly thought, well, one day, why doesn't she take them straight off the burner, you know, and bring them on the table and stick them on the table and say, hey, you, hand that pan round like, oh, no, 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 no. But the only reason you can serve this dish up, this fish is served on a silver platter this length. And all these other things are exquisite. But what about the things that burned on the back stove? What about all the grease and the dirt? She didn't sit down and enjoy the meal. No, I get a lot of help out of that. So many of the greatest saints, the most usable people for God, never surface. These arrogant little people that strut and shout the stuff on the platform, you know, as though, well, uh, just take advantage while you can see me because once I'm gone, the kingdom will fall apart. They almost imply that. Jesus had no ostentation, he had no show. After all, a man comes and he sits on a piece of a, a, a hill here. It's not like this. There's no thunder. There's no lightning. Nobody's terrified. Under the old economy, what was it? Everything that came to that mountain that shouldn't, if it should, if it approached, was cursed. That's the old economy. It's cursed. The first word from his lips was blessed. What a difference. There, nobody could draw near. Here, everybody draws. It is true that immediately in front of him were the disciples. As I said yesterday, setting up that kingdom was, was to me just an astounding thing because if you, if you think of Jesus sitting here, then immediately in front of him were the disciples and, and here's a great multitude. And here you have the Pharisees and Sadducees and, and uh, Roman soldiers and everybody that are going to take no notice of him as it were. He's trying to establish a kingdom with, with all hostility and over here Adam had a perfect environment. No hostility and he messed it up. I can't prove this, but I kind of think one day in eternity, Jesus said to his father, and you know, we, we never dwell really on the, much on the father, do we? When did you last hear a sermon on God the Father? Holy Spirit? Oh, hundreds of books on the Holy Spirit. We don't think much about God the Father. As I say again, if you take the old song that says, Out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. God was lonely. Heaven was empty for 30 years. Heaven was empty for 30 years. We don't think of the loneliness of the Father. <clears throat> I don't know what clues you have to the grief that God had when his whole system collapsed. When Adam wrecked it, 
Well, let, look, how do you think God looks down on the world today when every blessed commandment that he made is violated? Seems as though the government goes out of its way to dismantle the Ten Commandments. Murder doesn't matter anymore. Rape doesn't get off with rape. Thieving? <clears throat> Abortion? In God we trust in our coins. And I say it respectfully, but to hell with everything else he said. Well, how long do you think God's going to wink at the nation doing that? With more light, more gospel, more, more broadcast, more literature than any nations on earth. We also have the world's record right now for crime. We have the world's record for divorce. Come on now. We pollute the Sabbath, whether you, whichever Sabbath you want. The Lord's Day anyhow, too. God looks down and sees the wreckage around him. 2,000 years since Jesus came and you've got areas of the world that are still locked up in heathenism. I'm always hitting against the kids with guitars. I'm nothing against guitars or anything. But it's much easier to get a guitar and get on the road and make a bit of money and settle down and, and get your records out than it is to go and lose yourself in a jungle somewhere for Christ. This generation of Christians is IS 10 feet high is responsible for this generation of heathen. <coughs> and I remember going up a path in the, in the wilds of Papua New Guinea where people hardly wear a G-string, where, no, where there's not a shop or a hospital or a school or anything. It's dirt and that's all it is. You go in houses, they're wall-to-wall dirt. It's totally uncivilized. I said, I'd like to go over that range of mountains. They said, well, three white men have gone over. Not one of them came back. They ended up in the soup. cannibals there. Well, do you think the church is going to make it any faster the next 2,000 years than she's done this to... People say, well, well, of course, we're going to saturate the world with TV. Well, good night, those people up there never seen a TV. They, they can't afford a, a, a shirt, never mind the TV. Well, somebody says, well, look, Mr. So-and-so was telling us he has a TV program in the state and every Sunday he touches uh, 10 million people. Okay, he touches 10 million. Mr. So-and-so was on, he says he has 15 million. Mr. Somebody else comes on, he says he has 23 million. And they go on and you hear all these big boys talking. And when you add it all up, say you've got 195 million people every Sunday. That's pure nonsense. Pure nonsense. Why? Because as soon as this man's program goes off, the same 10 million listen to him. When he's gone off, the same bunch of, we don't cover more than a few million we saturate people from morning till night with the gospel you say are you against TV preaching I don't think much to it I think it's nice for people in hospital and so forth but I'm going to suggest the man that was in a nightclub last night switches on Sunday morning and says I don't know who to listen to this morning hmm? when, when you're away somewhere do you go into a hotel and then uh, at night say well I hope let's see channel uh, where do they have the night shows and the strippers? Not you, you don't turn to that junk. Well, if you don't turn to the program of the ungodly, what makes you think the ungodly turn to our programs? By and large, they don't. I still think there is no alternative to going into all the world to preach the gospel. But God takes individuals. Unredeemed men need redeemed men to go and tell them he worked his miracle in me. Isn't that what it's all about? He did it in me. Because he did it in me, as the Quaker would say, he can do it in thee. Well, my time's up.